First Chronicles chapter 15. Let's get to it. Awesome. We're going to freak out the Sunday school teachers once again. <laughs> okay. Um, we already got through uh, part of chapter 15, and uh, so um, I wanted to I wanted to pick it up um, towards the end, uh, just kind of just kind of go over it a, a little bit because it goes down into into chapter 16, and and um, there's some there's some good stuff in there. So let's pray, and we'll get started. Father, we just want to uh, again. Uh, bring our hearts before you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the changes it makes in us. Thank you for uh, the fact that it's uh, it's something that you use to convict our hearts, but it's also something that you use to encourage us and build us up. And Lord, that's what we want to see happening as we're going through your word here uh, this evening. We pray that um, as we go through and look at David's um, life and his walk with you, Lord, uh, that we'd emulate it, that we'd have the same kind of heart that he had towards you. And Lord, uh, we know that when that kind of stuff happens, we get the same kinds of results uh, that he had from you. And so, um, Lord, we just give you the evening and pray that you bless the study and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you remember that um, what's happening in chapter 15 is, is that David is moving uh, the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and um, he's moving it correctly. So um, chapter 3 is basically about David moving the ark right or doing it right. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the themes that you have uh, through chapters um, 13, 14, and 15 is the idea that God has, um, he has a purpose and a plan in the things that he does. He has a way that um, he wants to be approached, and he doesn't compromise it. And it's something that we need to keep in mind as believers. Um, there's, a, there's an approach to God. And, and there are things that he wants to see happening in my life, things that he wants to see happening in your life, and he's not going to compromise it. He's not going to mess around with it. And so um, when, you, when you get to chapter, uh, chapter 15 in, in verse 13, David is speaking and he says, for because you did not do it, the first time, and he's talking about the Levites carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the Ark of the Lord God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bore the Ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. And just really quick, um, uh, basically the, the first time that David tried to move the ark, what he did was he copied the Philistines. And a lot of times when Christians do stuff, what they do is they copy the world. I don't need to copy the world. In fact, you know what? Um, God is the, the most, you know, obviously God is the creator. And so he, he's going to be the most creative being this world has ever seen. He created everything that we see, right? And so if I'm actually following the Lord, am I going to be more creative than the world or less creative than the world? More. That's the way that it's supposed to work. And, um, you know, when, when, I, when I look at the Lord, God is strong, right? He's a strong fortress. He's a strong tower. And so when I, when I look at the difference between me in the Lord and people in the world, who's supposed to be stronger, you know, it's supposed to be me. It's supposed to be us. And when you, when you look at everything that the Lord does, whether you're, whether you're talking about creativity in the arts or create, creativity in music, which is the arts too, or uh, strength of character or strength of will or just getting things done, who should, who should be excelling in everything? Yeah, it should be the believers that are excelling. And so I think it's silly to look at what the world does and try to copy them. I think, I, I think it's just nothing but a compromise. And um, a lot of times the, the reason that we do that is because we want to be people who are acceptable to those who are in the world. And we think that what's going to happen is if I act like them and I talk like them and I, I, I become like them, that on some level they're going to like me and somewhere in there I'm going to be able to slip the gospel in. And the fact is that all you, all you end up being is somebody who is a lousy heathen. And what I mean by that is, is you're trying to act in exactly the same ways that the heathens act, and you don't do it well, you look really stupid doing the whole thing because that's not where you live, that's not who you are. I had a friend of mine one time who 
was, uh, you know, he'd been walking with the Lord and um, he was having a struggle um, with God and, uh, and his walk. And this one time he ended up in a bar. And he's sitting in this bar and this old guy comes walking up to him and strikes up a conversation with him. They didn't get into a real big conversation, but you know, after just a few minutes, the guy looks at him and he goes, what are you doing here? And my friend, the Christian, is like, what are you talking about? And he goes, you don't belong here. And, and the guy hadn't said anything about following the Lord. And he goes, what do you mean I don't belong here? He goes, you're not like the rest of us. You don't belong here. And the guy looks at him and he goes, you know what? You're absolutely right. Puts down his drink, turns around, walks out of the bar, never goes back again, you know? And, and, you know, that's, that's really how it is when you're looking at what people in the world are doing. You know, before I was a Christian, when I would see Christians who tried to cozy up to me and tried to act like me and that kind of stuff, I just, I just thought that they were silly. I thought they were compromisers. I thought they, you know, I was like, if you're going to be a Christian, just go be a Christian. Don't, you know, don't sit there and try to be cool with me because you're not cool in the first place. So you know what? When, when I'm looking at, at being a believer in the world, I already know I'm not cool. I already know that I'm on the outside. You know, the, the Bible in, in 1 Peter talks about the fact that we are peculiar people unto the Lord. You're peculiar. And it's just the way that it is. And so you just need to, you need to live there, you need to own it, and you need to go with it. You don't have to copy the world to get things done. In fact, uh, again, what, what can happen is um, you can get yourself in real problems. That's what David did. And when David starts moving the ark, and we've already covered this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But when David goes back to the word and he goes to the proper way to move the ark, then it's just nothing but a blessing. And God ables to, is able to honor him. And so when you look at verses uh, 13 all the way down to verse 16, what you have there is there's an order. And um, the order is according to the word of God in the, in the first place. That's what David says in verse 13. We didn't do it the first time because we did not consult the Lord about the proper order. We need to do it according to the word of God. Secondly, um, the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves. If you want to be filled by God, if you want, if you want to have God be really at work in your life, then you're going to have to be sanctified. It means being set apart for the Lord. You want to be filled by God, you're going to have to be empty of yourself. That's the idea of being sanctified. So you set yourself apart. And then thirdly, they did it according to biblical principles. When we look at the things that we do in our life, whether it's my business or my marriage or my parenting or whatever I'm doing, when I look at the things that I'm doing in my life, I should be able to point to passages in the Bible that say, this is how it's done. This is why I do these things this way. And um, you do that and God's going to bless it. When you look down in verse 16, and I wanted to get it, get this in, we already, we already talked about some of this, but I'm going to hit on it again when we get to chapter 16 here. It says, Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers uh, accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, cymbals, by raising the voice with resounding joy. So the, Levi, the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel, and of his brethren, Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of their brethren, the sons of uh, Merari, Ethan, the son of uh, Cushiah, and all these other guys. <laughs> and they became the singers. And they, they were singing as the ark was being transported. Did you know that in, in the New Testament, there's not really a passage that speaks about worship leaders? There's not one in the New Testament. There's no gift of worship leading in the New Testament, but you do find it in the Old Testament in connection with the temple, in connection with the, with the, with the tabernacle, specifically David. Um, he was called the sweet psalmist of Israel. And he was a guy who loved worship. And when he, when he got in control of the nation of Israel, he appointed worship leaders to lead the congregation in worship. Congregational worship was something that you see in the Old Testament. In fact, there's a whole book of nothing but worship songs, right? You know what it's called? Psalms. So the book of Psalms is nothing but worship songs. And a lot of those were written by, by David himself. It's, it's a, it's a really interesting thing that when God is doing a work in a person or when God is doing work, a work in a group of people that worship becomes important. Um, it, it doesn't become the most important because you don't see David ever abandoning the word of God for singing. He never does that. 
He's always somebody who, um, who honors God's word. And in, um, in New Testament times, you don't see Jesus abandoning the word of God or any of the other, other apostles abandoning the word of God for worship. But what you do see is that when people are understanding and, um, and getting what the Bible has to say, um, what they start doing is they start having a heart towards God where they fall in love with him. And that love is expressed in the worship songs that we sing. I like the, I like the set that uh, the girls just did um, when we were uh, worshiping just now because uh, actually I like worship that's just directed towards the Lord. And, you know, I'm partial to that. I like singing to Jesus. And, and so I, I just love that a lot because that's the one I'm here to worship. That's the one here I, I'm here to talk to. And when, when you really understand what the Bible has to say, it's all about Jesus anyway. And it's all about what God's done for us. And so that should bring up a heart of thanksgiving. And along with that comes worship. In fact, the Bible says that if you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to be singing to yourself and self in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Being filled with the Spirit of God and being, being filled with the love of God forces you towards worship. And that's what you see with David. And so worship is just, is just this awesome thing. Um, it was, it was something that I was not used to when I first became a Christian. Um, I didn't sing at any time at, in any place except for in my car by myself with the windows rolled up before I was a believer. I never, I never sang in front of anybody. When I came to church, one of the weirdest things that, that, um, I had to deal with in church was this whole singing thing. In fact, when I, when I first came, I liked the talking part, but the singing part, I, you know, I just really wasn't into because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, um, really comfortable with my voice and whether or not I sounded good and I was way, just way too self-conscious about the whole thing. And then I found out that the Bible says that I don't have to make a beautiful noise to the Lord. I have to make a joyful one. And so there are times when I'm singing and it's noise, but it's joyful. <laughs> You know, not not always necessarily dead on on key and that kind of stuff. And we've got we've got a, a brother in our in our fellowship, and I want to I don't want to call him out, but um, we got a we actually we got a couple people in our fellowship that cannot hold a tune. They cannot. They, you know, it's it, it's like uh, you know, tone deaf is is exactly what they are. But when they sing, they sing loud. And they sing long and they sing strong. And I, you know what, actually, I love it. You know, sometimes it throws me off and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, they just sit there and they belt it out. And the reason that they're belting it out is because they're in love with the Lord. And they don't need to have, you know, they don't need to sing a beautiful song. They just need to sing a joyful one. And so that's, that's what's going on with this. Verse 25, it says, So David, the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And so it was when God helped the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bulls and seven rams, and David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who bore the Ark, the singers and Cananiah, uh, uh, the uh, music master with the singers. David also wore a linen ephod. And we talked about this last time. David was not wearing underwear when he was dancing before the Lord. And every every time that I've seen this portrayed in movies or um, I've even heard pastors talking about this, that David was out there in his underwear. No, he wasn't. He was wearing a robe and over the top of the robe, he had a vest on, which was what the ephod was. The, the, the complaint about David uh, being naked that you see in 2 Samuel is, is not the idea that he was out there in his underwear. It's the idea that he wasn't wearing his kingly robes. He was just wearing plain white because what he wanted to do was look like a Levite. He wanted no, dif- no distinction between the priests of God and David. Um, he was just going before the Lord um, in humility. And because of that, he got capped on. It says, um, verse 28, Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting, with the sound of the horn, with trumpets, and with cymbals, making music with stringed instruments and harps. And it happened as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michael Saul's daughter looked through a window, saw King David whirling and playing music, and she despised him in her heart. 
One of the things that um, is going to happen when you offer real worship to the Lord is there is that there is go- going to people be people who do not get it. They do not understand why you're like that. Why are you so crazy like that? Why do you, why do you sing like that? In fact, I um, I had girlfriends that I would take to church before I got married. Well, obviously, before I I never took any girlfriends <laughs> to church after I got married. So. <laughs> But I had some girlfriends that when I would be uh, sitting there singing, they were, they were, they tried to discourage me. And they, they, they were like, why are you so into that? Why are you singing so loud? It's kind of embarrassing and stuff. And I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong with my voice? You don't like my voice, chick? You know, I just break up with them right there. Get out of my face, chick. Get, you know, go away. No, I didn't. I was nicer than that. But in any case, uh, it didn't last. And the reason it didn't last is because it didn't have the same heart towards the Lord that I have. And uh, again, it's it's one of those things that we need to keep in mind. Just because you're doing the right thing doesn't mean that everybody's going to applaud you. And so there are going to be times when you're doing the right thing towards the Lord and in your offerings towards God, and uh, the world's not going to applaud, and sometimes people in church don't applaud either. I remember one time I, I went to a, a church with a friend, and, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there singing and, I, you know, I'm lift, you know, it was a cool song. And so I'm lifting my hands when I'm singing. And I wasn't doing this and waving or anything like that. But I was in a church where you didn't do that. You just kind of kept your hands to your side. And I didn't know it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm worshiping, got my eyes closed, and I raise my hands. And I, and I get done with the song and I go, I look up and everybody around me is staring at me. Like something was wrong with me. And again, it's... It's that whole, that whole thing. So it's not just people who are outside necessarily that might pick on you if you're um, offering pure and um, loving worship to God. Sometimes it's people um, who are inside too. And again, they just don't get it. So verse uh, chapter 16, um, again, with the right moving of the ark, it says, verse one, so they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And what what is happening here, we've talked about this before, but what is happening here is this is a sacrifice. So what they're they're doing is they're, they're bringing the the Ark of the Covenant in. And when they did sacrifices, they weren't just killing animals just for the sake of killing animals. Many times the sacrifices that were being offered were literally a, um, a, a sacrifice that was being offered um, to the Lord as a picture of a meal with God. And so when when you went into the temple many times, part of the animal that was sacrificed would go to your family. Part of it would go to the priest. Part of it would go onto the altar. Actually, always the fat and the insides went on the altar of every sacrifice. And it's the idea that God wants the best and God wants the heart. And um, then uh, the right shoulder usually went to the priest. It's a, it's a picture of uh, God being a priest's strength. And then the rest of the animal went to the family and they were eating a meal with God. So sacrifices were a picture of having a meal with the Lord. So when Jesus says in uh, the book of Revelation, chapter three, verse 20, when he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. I memorized that in the King James Version. What he's talking about is having a meal with you. And, and it's, a, again, a picture of this communal meal that, that, that we have with God um, when a sacrifice was made. And so that's what's going on here. The sacrifices have been made. David's offered a, a number of animals to the Lord. And what he does is he includes all the people of Israel who are there in this sacrifice. And again, it's a, all, all a picture of having a, a meal with God in this whole thing. And it's, a, it's the idea of close fellowship. And this is, this is the best way um, I know to get this across. I have friends um, that I've known over the years that were kind of formal, formal friends. And so when we would have a meal together, usually it would be kind of a formal thing. 
and you know, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, that that kind of thing. Just a just a little bit uncomfortable. And it wasn't that there wasn't good fellowship and and that kind of stuff. But you know, I'm watching my manners and I'm making sure that I'm eating with one hand. I don't have my you know I don't have both arms on the table and stuff like that. And I'm I'm watching myself because I don't want to be offensive in their home and that kind of stuff. It's a little it's a little bit formal. Um, sometimes people think that that's the kind of relationship that they need to have with God. That is not the kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. Every one of these sacrifices is like a barbecue. And so like when you have a barbecue, there, there's barbecue sauce. And so what you, what you have to have is you have to have a plate and you have to have a napkin. Usually you have to have two napkins. You have to have a napkin that's sitting in your lap, maybe three. Another one that's, that's sitting on your shirt. And another one that you have within, um, within reach because barbecue sauce is going everywhere. That's, that's, that's a barbecue to me. And so you're sitting there, you know, slobbering and slobbering bar yeah, barbecue sauce is all over your face and that kind of thing. If you're going to eat barbecue with somebody, um, there, there's not a lot of formality involved in this. And so you get barbecued chicken. Somebody, somebody eats barbecued chicken with a knife and a fork. There's something wrong with you. That's just messed up. You're supposed to grab it by the, you know, grab it by the bone, grab it by the leg, and you know, and you bite into it, and that kind of thing. And so, Jesus wants to have not a formal meal with you; he wants to have a barbecue with you. If you were having a meal with Jesus, you know, you ever have friends that would let you have a bite of their burrito? That that's the kind of friend that God wants to be with you. Jesus would would offer you a bite of his burrito. And, and, you know, and then he'd give you a bite and then he'd take a bite. And, and if you wanted more, he'd give you more. And it's that kind of closeness. So you don't have that kind of closeness, closeness with a lot of people, but it's the kind of closeness that God wants to have with you and me. And so every sacrifice, you guys, was a barbecue. It's a picture there. And so I think that's kind of cool. And then again in verse 4, it says, And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord. Asaph the chief, next to him Zechariah, then Jael, Shemaramoth, Jehiel, and all these other guys um, with stringed instruments and harps, but Asaph made music with cymbals. Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the, of the Covenant of God. And so again, uh, music not just from Israel, but from men set apart for the service of God to honor the Lord with worship. And you can see there, in the worship, to commemorate. That's the idea of remembering what God's done, to thank, and that's obviously the idea of being thankful for the things that God has done, and then finally to praise the God of Israel. You know, um, the, the Bible talks about glorifying the Lord, and one of the things that we do when we worship is we glorify the Lord. And I like that word, um, is, especially in, in the New Testament. The word for glorify means to speak well of. So literally, every time you see the word glorify in the New Testament, it means to speak well of. And there are times when glorify means some of the things that we think it means. Like, you know, God, God makes you um, big and bold and, and awesome and, and that kind of stuff. When we go to heaven, we're going to be glorified um, when we get there. But most often, actually in every instance, it comes from words that just mean to speak well of. And so when I'm glorifying the Lord, that's what I'm doing. I'm speaking well of God. I'm talking about the things that he's done for me. I'm rem remembering the way that um, he's delivered me in time past, and I'm honoring God with those things. I'm speaking well of him. And that, again, is what worship is supposed to be. In verse 7, it says, On that day David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. And so you have in verses 7 through 36, David's psalm of praise. Actually, this comes from, from three different psalms in the Bible. Verses 8 through 22 come, come from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 15. Uh, verses 23 through 33 come from Psalm 96, verses 1 through 13. And verses 34 and 36 uh, through 36 come from Psalm 106, verse 1, and 106, verses 47 through 48. So let's go through and read it. Verse 8, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. 
Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servants, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. And so lots of stuff in there um, that we could talk about. But basically, again, it's the whole idea of glorifying God, um, not just to him, but making it known uh, that he's done awesome things, verse 8, among the peoples. Making it known what God's done through you and for you to the people who are around you. And that's, uh, that's kind of the gist of what witnessing is. When we give our testimony to people, when we let people know what Jesus has done in our life, what we're doing is we're making known his deeds among the people. And one of the things that um, God uses in just radical ways is your testimony, the things that God's done in your life. It's good to know the Bible. It's good to have Bible verses memorized. It's a, that's a really good thing. Um, I, I, uh, when I'm sharing with people, I have my testimony, and I have the things I share with them peppered with Bible verses because the Bible says that God's word will not return void. It's going to accomplish whatever God purposes, right? And so I use it that way. So I use lots of Bible verses when I'm talking to people. But the Bible is not this magic book that if I say a bunch of Bible verses at somebody, then suddenly they're going to get saved. It needs to be something that's that, that's tied in with a real story about what God's done in your life. And so it's a good thing for you to have prepared your testimony. It's the, you know, the idea of just being able to, like in five minutes, to tell people the things that God has done for you and why you're a believer, why you follow him. And here's what's cool about this. You can have a conversation, a theological conversation with people about who God is, how God's the creator, um, how Jesus is who he said he is, and all that kind of stuff. And people can argue with you about that. But once you start talking to them about what God has done in your life and the way that he's changed you and how awesome he's been, there's no arguing with that. And usually it's at that point that people just stop, they shut up, and I've literally had people stand there with their mouths hanging open, you know, as I've told them about the things that God's done for me. And so make, make known his deeds among the people. Again, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Do you talk about God's wondrous works in your, in your daily life, around your house, with your friends, with your family? Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. When you seek the Lord, one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be a joy in your heart. And when, when I'm talking about joy, I'm talking about happiness too. And it's, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to tie joy in with happiness in the sense of, um, you know, uh, happiness is, is exactly what joy is because it isn't. Joy is something that's deeper than that. But God wants you happy. You know, um, in, Matthew chapter 5, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, when it, when it says, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who mourn, for they're going to be comforted, and so on, and all the way through there. You know what blessed means in that passage? Oh, how happy. It means, oh, how happy. And when you have this right relationship with God, um, there's going to be an inner peace, there's going to be a joy that you have, and it's going to be connected with happiness. Happiness, and the reason I don't want to totally connect it with joy is because happiness comes from the word happenstance. And it's the idea of my circumstances make me happy. And so if I got good circumstances, then I'm going to be happy. If, I, if I've got bad circumstances, then I'm not going to be happy. Joy, on the other hand, is peace and happiness that's, that, that you have in your life, despite the fact that your circumstances might not be, be going very well. And so it's not connected with happenstance. It's, it's just the joy that we have in following the Lord. Again, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. And that's where we're supposed to be. I'm going to, I'm going to get all bogged down here if I don't, if I don't get on. Verse 14, it says, he's the Lord our God. Um, his judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, this covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance when you were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. When they went from one nation to another and from one kingdom to another people, he per permitted no 
man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. And so in that section, what uh, David is talking about is the fact that God is somebody who keeps his promises. He made this promise to Abraham that he was going to bless the nation of Israel, that he was going to give them the land of Canaan, and that he was going to protect them. Those who bless them, God would bless. Those who curse them, God would curse. You realize that you're, the reason that you're going to heaven is because God plugged you into the Abrahamic covenant? One of the things that God, you know, God said three things to Abraham. I'm going to give you land, and that's the land of Canaan. And I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you a great nation. You're, the, the people who come from your loins, Abraham, are going to be more than the, than the stars of the heaven, more than the sand of the she, seashore in number. And so he lets Abraham know that he's going to be part of a great nation or the father of a great nation. But then he says, and from your seed all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And that's where we come in. The fact that God kept a promise to Abraham not only means that Israel got the land that they were promised and that Israel got the protection that they were promised and that Israel got the nation that they were promised, it also means that Israel got the, the man that they were promised, the seed of Abraham, Jesus, who was going to bless all the nations of the earth and bring us in. We come in under the blessing portion of the Abrahamic covenant. And so the fact that God was faithful to Abraham means, means that I can come into this relationship with God. And it's just a very cool thing. God keeps his promises. When God promises something, he does it. And uh, again, David talks about that. When he says, when he ends up in the, at the end there, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. God has the same attitude towards you and towards me. Doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen and that people aren't going to say rotten things. Bad things happen to Israel and people said rotten things about those guys, right? But God always makes sure that it comes out in the wash, that it gets taken care of. And sometimes it gets taken care of quickly, and sometimes it take, gets taken care of over a period of time, but God always takes care of it. He always takes care of it. And so I can trust him to protect me. Verse 23, sing to the Lord, and this is where Psalm 96 starts in, sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all the peoples. And again, you have that whole theme of witnessing to the people who are around you. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols. Um, for, the, uh, for the Lord made the heavens. Um, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him, O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. There's a, there's a psalm that says praise is comely. Praise looks good. And when, when you have somebody that really loves the Lord and re is really honoring the Lord, I'm not talking about being fake or you know being a showboat or anything like that, but they love the Lord and they're honoring him and they're offering praise to him, it looks good. It not only looks good to other Christians, but a lot of times it look, looks good to um, unbelievers too. When, when you are walking through your life and your life is something that honors and praises God, people want to know what's different about you. And again, you have that kind of theme throughout, here, throughout the, the word. Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. So not only am I supposed to be in love with the Lord, and not only am I supposed to be glorifying the Lord, I'm supposed to tremble before him. And that's the idea of the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Both things. Knowledge, you don't have right knowledge until you have the fear of God. And you don't have wisdom until you have the fear of God. And I'm not saying that people who don't fear God don't know things. But they don't know things in the way that they should. They don't have it all put together. They don't. They don't have an understanding. And I, I remember when I was when I was in high school. I was I was always good at school. I was always good at science. Always good at math and that kind of stuff. But when when I got a, got out of high school, I realized that most of the knowledge that I had was disconnected 
It wasn't connected to anything. It was just stuff that I'd learned from books. I knew how to do problems. I knew how to, I knew how, how certain parts of science went together and that kind of stuff, but I didn't know how it fit into the, into the whole package, basically. I didn't know how things fit into the creation. I didn't know how things fit in my life. I was book smart, street stupid, basically. You ever, you ever run into people like that? Book smart, street stupid. They don't, you know, they don't know how life should go. And in a lot of ways, I was just like that. But when I became a Christian, I started figuring out how things plugged in. The beginning of the, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If I don't understand that God is boss, I'm never going to know things like I should know them. If I'm always questioning God, if I'm always, if I, if I'm always wondering if God's got it right, if I'm always wondering if God knows what my problems are, knows how things should go, if I, if, I, if I don't have the attitude that God actually knows what's going on, he's actually my Lord, and I'm actually somebody who's supposed to be following him, doing the things that he tells me to because I fear him, I'm not going to have the knowledge that I need. And wisdom is defined as knowledge rightly applied. Wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. And so then there's getting to know things, and then, there, uh, there, then there's getting, taking those things and being able, able to apply them to my life, or, in a very cool way, telling people how they can apply it to their lives, too. And if I don't have a fear of God, I'm not going to have that either. I, I know guys who have Bible verses stacked up in their head, and they have no fear of God, and they're just jerks. And I, I know guys who have uh, knowledge on all kinds of level stacked up in their heads and they do stupid things constantly. And it's wrapped up with this whole thing with the fear of God. You know, I, I never think that I, um, I know more than the Lord does. And, and one of the things that I stopped doing a long time ago was just sitting there questioning God on every issue that came up. I stopped doing it a long time ago because I finally figured out that I'm dealing with a guy who knows the end from the beginning. He lives outside of time. He, you know, he didn't write down the Bible and then come along to Steve Winery and go, oh, you know what? Didn't know that was going to happen in your life. Just, you know, just take everything that I wrote down and make sure that you don't apply it to you because you, Steve, are a special case. You know, and a lot of people get like that. And I've done that. I've done exactly the same thing. And what I found, what I found as, um, as I began growing in the Lord is that when God says certain things, he means it. And he's, and he's saying those things for a reason. And so I can go along and do what I want to do and just, you know, question God left and right. And what I'm going to get is the same kind of results for doing those things that people in the world get. And it doesn't matter if I'm a Christian or not. I'm going to get exactly the same results. And so, you know, the Bible says, I don't know, don't go around, sleep around, right? Because if you do that, things happen. Here's some things that happen. Babies happen. And so you, get, you, you can get all, in all kinds of problems with sexual immorality because babies come along. And then you go, well, I don't really want to pay the consequences of having a child. And so what I'll do is I'll get an abortion. Okay, or I'll get my girlfriend to get an abortion. And then what you have is a death on your hands now. And the Bible talks about the fact that blood that's been spilled is going to be given an account of. And when you spill blood, that it defiles the land. And, and people do these things, and what they're doing is looking for an easy way out, and then they pay for them the rest of their lives. I've got friends who have had abortions, and they remember two dates during the year, the date that their baby should be born and the date that they aborted their child. And every year, every year, for the rest of their lives, those are dates that they remember. They're paying for it for the rest of their lives. The reason that God said not to do it, um, you know, it's, it's not sin because, it's, it's not bad because God said it's sin, and God is not telling us not to sin um, because he wants to wreck our fun. He tells us not to sin because it destroys us. Sin is bad, and it destroys us, whether it feels good at the time or not, whether it looks like the easiest answer or not. 
And so you can go on and you can talk about all kinds of things. You know, I get in a, in a, in a situation at work where I'm supposed to have done something and I didn't do it right or I didn't do it at all. And somebody calls me on that whole thing. And so what do I do? I lie. Right? To get out, to get out of the whole thing. And the Bible talks about you shall not bear false witness. Don't tell lies to people. And then what happens is people start figuring those things out and then I lose trust and I lose, you know, I can lose my job and that kind of stuff. I have, I have people who come in and talk with me with sob stories that just go on and on. And every single one of them has to do with disobeying the commands of God. And the reason that they do it is because they don't fear the Lord. And they're looking for an easy way out. And God, um, God is, is telling us to go in a certain way and act a certain way because he wants to bless us. I need to have a fear of God. And it, it's not, it, it's not an, uh, a, a situation where uh, I need to just be afraid of God, like, I, like God's going to stomp on me all the time. You know, obviously we've been going through here and reading about the fact that God is good and God blesses us and God protects us and that kind of thing. But... I need to have a fear of God in the sense, in the sense that I don't want to disappoint Him. And I, uh, again, I need to be taking Him seriously. There's another passage that talks about trembling at His word. Trembling at His word. Do you tremble at God's word? When God says something, is it optional for you? Or do you go, whoa, maybe I better get that straight. And trembling at His word is again something that that needs to be happening. Um, enough said about that. Verse 31, it says, Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad, and let them say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that's in it. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord, for he's coming to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he's good, for his mercy endures forever. And say, save us, O God of our salvation, gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. And so David uh, blessed, uh, and he ends it with, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, amen, and praise the Lord. You guys know what amen means? So be it, so be it. When you, when you end a prayer with amen, it's a, it, it, it doesn't mean signing off. <laughs> you know, or all done, or goodbye now. It means so be it. I like that. So he left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark regularly, as every day's work required. Um, and Obed-Edom, with his 68 brethren, including Obed-Edom, the son of uh, Jeduthun and Hasa, to be gatekeepers, and Zadok the priest and his brethren the priests, before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place that was at Gibeon, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offering regularly morning and evening and to do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel. And with them Heman and Jeduthun and the rest who were chosen, who were designated by name to give thanks to the Lord because his mercy endures forever. And with them Heman and Jeduthun to sound aloud with trumpets and cymbals, the musical instruments of God. Now the sons of Jeduthun were gatekeepers. Then all the people departed every man to his house and David returned to bless his house. This is what's being spoken about. You know, when, when Israel came into the land, um, they had what was called a tabernacle, and the Ark of the Covenant was in the tabernacle. It was a tent that um, God had, had um, Moses uh, put together. And so they come into the land, and after they crossed the, the Jordan, the tabernacle was at Gilgal, and that's where it remained for seven years. Afterward, it was re removed to a place called Shiloh, and if you've gone to Israel with us, every time that we go to Israel, we go to Shiloh because it's one of those places that you can go that, where you can see, like literally see where the tabernacle was. It's also where Samuel um, uh, ministered. And, uh, and that's kind of a cool thing. Um, during the days of, of Eli, it was there until the days of Eli. And um, then it was carried out of the camp, camp when the uh, Israelites were at war with the Philistines and the Philistines captured it. And we talked about that earlier on. Um, it was never afterwards restored to the tabernacle itself. At that point, um, the, the old tabernacle that w had been erected by Moses in the wilderness was transferred to a place called Nob. And if you remember the story of 
David going to the tabernacle and getting Goliath's sword and eating the showbread and all that stuff, that was at Nob. And then afterwards, Saul comes in and kills all the priests at Nob at that point. And so that's Nob. And after that city was destroyed, it was moved to Gibeon. And that's what's being spoken about here. Um, a new tabernacle was built by David in Jerusalem. So now you have two tabernacles. One's at Gibeon, one's at Jerusalem. And the one at Gibeon is where they're offering sacrifices and that kind of stuff. And the one at Gibeon, or the one at Jerusalem, um, was uh, where um, Abiathar was a priest in Jerusalem. So Zadok is the priest at Gibeon, Abiathar is the priest in Jerusalem. And so two tabernacles, one of them held the Ark of the Covenant and the other one had all the other, uh, had the um, uh, table of showbread and the uh, seven branch candlestick and all of that stuff, um, along with the altar, the brazen altar. Okay, chapter 17. This is, this is the Davidic covenant here. And one of the, one of the things that we have uh, fulfilled in the New Testament is that Jesus comes from the line of David. And this is, this is one of the passage, uh, passages in the Bible that deals with that whole promise that God gave to David that he was going to have an enduring kingdom. You remember what um, God said to Saul? Uh, Saul was a king before David. And when God spoke to Saul, he said, if you'll follow me and you'll, if you'll be faithful to me, then I'm going to give you an enduring house. He promised Saul exactly the same promise that he gave to David, only Saul was not a guy who was faithful to the Lord. And so what ended up happening was he was basically a, a, a one-hit wonder. Um, he, he, was, he was the king. He um, didn't have any children who ended up being king. In fact, his children died with him. Uh, because of his disobedience. But to David, David was given the promise of God that um, he was going to have a lineage that lasted forever. And ultimately, it was going to culminate in the coming of Jesus. Jesus is from the line of David. This is the story where God makes this promise to David. So in chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when David was dwelling in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is under curtain, under tent curtains. Then Nathan said to David, do all that's in your heart, for God is with you. I like David's heart here. Um, David's looking around at what he's living in, and then, he's, then he looks at what he's built for the Ark of the Covenant. And David's living in a house of cedar, um, nice paneling, Nice place. Actually, we, we, we know where David's palace was. Um, they've been excavating the foundations of David's palace for years now. And again, when we go to Israel, we go there. And um, uh, when David built his house, uh, there, there was all kinds of imported woods that were involved. And it was made out of stone, you know, lined on the inside with cedar like David's talking about. And then he thinks about the Ark of the Covenant, and it's just in a, in, under tent curtains. And he's like, it's not fair. It's not fair that I've spent all this on myself, and there's the Ark of God sitting in a tent. And so David wants to build a house for the Lord. He wants to build a temple. And so Nathan the prophet, and actually this is the Nathan that later on comes in and talks to David about his sin with Bathsheba. Same guy. And actually, David probably named one of his sons after this guy. And not only that, he probably named one of his sons after this guy after the sin with Bathsheba. So you have this whole thing with, with David and Nathan that's actually a, a pretty cool thing. Um, David respected Nathan. And so Nathan says to David, do all that's in your heart for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. For I've not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. Wherever I've moved about with all Israel, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, 
I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you've gone and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. And I've made you a name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and, I, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, also I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you, talking about Saul. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. And so David, again, has this desire to build God a house, and Nathan's first blush on this whole thing is go for it. Sounds good, David. Do everything that's in your heart. But God has the final say in this whole issue. So when Nathan goes home, he's, um, he's that night in his home, and God begins speaking to him, and he says, I didn't tell you to build me a house. There's never been a time when I've told any of the judges to build me a house. You know, I've always dwelt in curtains, and what he's talking about is the Ark of the Covenant uh, being under curtains. And um, God... Uh, turns things around on Nathan and says, I want you to go back to David. I want you to tell him that he's not going to build me a house. His son will, but he's not going to. And um, again, you, you, you have this, this whole thing um, with a, with the Lord in this passage. You know, this this is one of the the things I really like about the Lord. David has a right heart towards God in the, in the sense that he doesn't want to dwell in some place that's better than the place where he's got the Ark of the Covenant. I like that heart. But God's not really worried about architecture. God's not worried about huge buildings, and he's not worried about, you know, great, you know, uh, you know, great lines and and, and great roof lines and and all that kind of stuff. He's not into architecture. In fact, you know, when I when I think of worship, if I had a choice between worshiping in an ornate building, it's not that we have that, because we don't. Um, or worshiping outside, you know which one I'd rather do? Every single time. I I love the amphitheater services, even when it gets hot and all that stuff, because you're out there and you're, you're, you're under the best cathedral that there could ever be. It's the vault of heaven, you know, and, and, and you're sitting there and, um, uh, even, even when I'm not doing the teaching, when I'm doing the teaching, a lot of times I'm kind of distracted and that kind of stuff because I'm thinking about what's coming next. But when I take a day off, um, or I, I take vacation and stuff. You know where I like to go to church? Calvary Chapel. <laughs> I like to go to church at Calvary Chapel, and my favorite service is the amphitheater amphitheater service. Uh, you know, if, I, if I'm off in the summer, I come down to the amphitheater service, and I sit down, and I have a great time. And, it, and it's just cool, you know, singing to the Lord and hearing the birds, and even hearing the cars on Clearwater. I don't care, you know. Just looking around, looking up at the sky, you know, uh, seeing, you know, seeing the, seeing the shadow from the sun and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just love that. And uh, it's always been like that. When I was uh, in, uh, in Southern California in Big Bear, I loved going out and, and praying outside. Actually, I, I like it here too. I don't do it much anymore because my wife always, you know, calls me on stuff. And so I can't sneak out. She's, she's a light sleeper. But um, for, for a long time, when I when I would uh, go to pray, I would sneak out of bed or try to sneak out of bed, and I'd go out in the, in the middle of the you know out in the middle of the boonies. We we lived by a dry lake bed up in Big Bear, and I'd go out in the middle of the dry lake bed, and I'd just sit there under the stars and sing to the Lord. And 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 I didn't read my Bible because it was too dark, but I'd sit there and pray and I'd sing to the Lord and that kind of stuff. Same thing at my house. I have a field. I got four acres, and so I go out in the middle of my field, and I sit down in the middle of the field, and the, you know, in the middle of the summer, with the stars up on, you know, up in the sky, and I spend time and pray and talk to the Lord. It's awesome. I think it's awesome. Well, God has built is better than anything that a man could build. In fact, um, God, when uh, He was talking about 
worship, um, worship in uh, uh uh, in Israel um, involved sacrifice. And God, when he spoke to these people about uh, the place where they would offer sacrifices, he said, if you build an altar, it needs to be of unhewn stones. In other words, just stones, just rocks that you pick up. I don't want you taking a chisel to them. And the the reason for that is because the sacrifice that was to be offered on that altar was something that was supposed to represent the work of God, not the work of man. And so I think that, that, um, there are times when, um, we can, we can get the, the focus off the, the place where it needs to be. Having big, big ornate buildings, that, that kind of thing. Um, I, I understand the attitude, uh, that's involved in that. We want to do something, well, it's like David wanted to do with, with the temple. Um, I want to build you a big ornate building. And, and I understand the heart that's behind it, but what God wants is just real worship and, you know, worship in an or, ornate building or in God's creation. I think every, every single time worship in God's creation is better than. In fact, you guys, whether it was a tabernacle or whether it was a temple, do you realize that the worship of Israel was always outside? The only guys who got to go inside the temple building or inside the tabernacle were the priests. And it was only one guy that got to do this. And so when a priest was, uh, was offering up incense in uh, the tabernacle or in the temple, it was one priest. He would go into the tabernacle. He would offer up the incense and he would pray before God. And then he would come back out. And that was his job. He was the guy who went in. And everybody else stood outside sang songs, offered sacrifices, did all that kind of stuff, but it was always outside. That's where, that's where worship took place until synagogues uh, came into use, and that wasn't until way later in Israel's history. And so, again, you, you have this, this whole thing going on. And you know what? I don't mind having a building, um, and when we built this building, I did it as cheaply as I could, and I tried to make it, make our cheap building as nice looking as I could. And I had some help with that whole thing. But this is just a steel building. And, you know, I, I, I think that, um, our focus should be on the worship of God rather than the buildings, um, that, uh, that we build. In any case, um, when, when God speaks to David, um, he says, I don't want you to build me a house. In fact, I'm going to build a house for you. I like that about the Lord. You want to build me a house? No, David, I'm not going to allow you to build me a house. I'm going to build a house for you. And I think that there are times when we got, you know, when we get the emphasis on the wrong syllable in situations, and especially in the worship of God. You know, um, it, it's important for us to to keep in mind that we have to have a, a lifestyle that's worthy of the calling that Jesus called us to, right? That's an important thing. I'm quoting right there. I'm, I'm, I'm referencing Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 1. Um, in, in that passage, it says, Therefore, walk worthy of the calling that you were called with. Okay? That's a shortened up version of that. You know what, what's in chapters one through three? It's all about what God's done for us. And it starts off with the fact that God chose us and that when he chose us, he didn't do it on the basis of anything that we were going to do or anything that we were at the time that he chose us. But he just chose us because he set his heart on us. And then it talks about the fact that he delivered us. He delivered us from sin and he delivered us to bondage to the world. Um, he, he took away the conflict that was between us and the people of God. Um, he made us part of his building in the sense of part of the church, part of this whole thing that he was doing, that he's been doing for thousands of years. And, um, the last verse, verses in Ephesians chapter three are these. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul says, therefore, walk worthy of the calling to which you were called. 
And the reason I'm telling you that is because, because before Paul ever starts, starts talking about our responsibilities to God, he talks about everything that God has done for us. That's in the book of Ephesians. In the book of Romans, chapters 1 through 11 are all about what God's done for us. In chapter 1, it talks about the fact that, you know, many of us were Gentiles and we were led astray and, and uh, you know, we were, we were caught up in sin and given over to, these, to, to all this junk and that we're guilty before God. In chapter 2, it goes through and talks about religious people. It says they're guilty before God too. In chapter 3, it lets you know that everybody on the planet's guilty before God and the only, the only recourse that we have is the grace of God in our life. In chapter 4, it talks about the fact that Abraham experienced this grace and that David experienced this grace. In chapter 5, it talks about the fact that sin came from Adam and because Adam died, then, then we're all going to die and that grace is coming from Jesus. In chapter 6, it talks about the fact that, you know, the, uh, that Jesus gives grace in my life and he gives me the power to live the life and so I should no longer be living in sin. I should be living in resurrection power. In chapter 7, it says that I've been delivered from the law by the death of my old man and that I have a new relationship with God because of, because of what God's done. Also in chapter 7, it talks about the fact that we've got problems. When we try to do things on our own, we never do the things that God wants us to. We're always failing, and it's because there isn't anything in me. In my flesh dwells no good thing. And so where's my trust got to be? And it's got to be in the power of God. Chapter 8 is all about that power of God that, that delivers me from my nonsense and my sin and all my junk and um, uh, the power of God that brings me into this relationship where I'm going to be standing before God in heaven forever. Chapter 9 is what happened to the Jews. Chapter 10 is the, the Jews decided not to. Chapter 11 is God's going to turn these people around and he's going to bring them back just like he brought you. And the, the, at the end of chapter 11, it says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who was first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? In other words, what, you know, is God ever going to be my debtor? And then it goes on and says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. And then it says, Therefore, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable act of worship, which is your reasonable service. And again, when you go through the book of Romans, 11 chapters on where we were and how God saved us and all the things that God has done for us. And then you get to chapter 12 and God goes, therefore, this is how we need to respond. And here's a point that I'm making. When, when, you're, when you're looking at how God works, what God does is he blesses us and he moves in our life and he does good things for us. And the, the reason that we offer worship to him and we offer praise to him and we offer our fear to him even, the reason that we do those things is because God has been so good to us. It's the goodness of God that leads me to repentance. That's out of Romans chapter 2. It's God's goodness that leads me to repentance. And if I'm constantly going through my life trying to impress God with all the things that I'm going to do for him, in this case, build you a house, God. I'm going to build you a house. If I'm going through my life trying to build God a house, I'm never going to have the relationship where um, my, my acts of worship and the, the things that um, I do for him are just nothing but pure praise and pure honoring, honoring of him. And I'm not saying that David didn't have that kind of heart because he did, but a lot of times we can get things backwards. I need to do all these things so that God will like me. I need to do all these things so that God will accept me. That is not the order. The order is that God already loves me. God already accepts me, despite the fact that I'm such a jerk. And, that, and, and because of that, I love him for it. And so all the things that we do for the Lord need to be a response to what God has done for us. I think that um, it's really important when we're going through, especially in the New Testament and reading our Bibles, it's really important for you to read the, read the books in the New Testament from the beginning 
I run into this with people all the time. They'll come in and they'll go, they'll, they'll show me a passage in scripture and they'll say, you know, it'll, it'll be a passage like in Ephesians chapter four where it talks about all these things that I need to be doing for the Lord. Same thing in chapter five and chapter six, all these things that I need to be doing for the Lord. And they're all wrapped up in those things. And I'm not doing them right. And I'm having a problem. And you know, I'll go, did you read verses, you know, chapters one through three? You know what the answer always is? No. What they're doing is they're flipping through their Bible and they get to passages that talk about all the things that, that they're supposed to be doing for the Lord. And they don't, they don't have the background. They don't have, they don't have the things that God's done for them. They don't even know what those things are. And so they're not acting out of, out of gratitude and thankfulness towards the Lord. They're acting out of obligation and trying to impress God. And that is never what God's called us to. It's never what God's called us to. You're not going to build him a house. He's going to build you one. That's what God wants to do. Okay? So, it goes on in the, in the passage, and again, verse 12, or verse 11, it says, It shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will be, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And obviously, he's talking about Solomon. He shall build me a house. I will establish his throne forever. Um, I will be, and it's not saying that Solomon's going to sit on the throne forever. It's saying that David's lineage is going to last forever. Okay. I will be his father. He shall be my son. I will not take uh, my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. And so God promises David a lineage and that is ultimately ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is from the line of David. He's the king of Israel. He's going to be the one who sits on the throne of Israel forever. Hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. It's one of those passages that's still um, waiting to be fulfilled. Okay, so it says verse 16, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O God. And you've also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come and have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree, O Lord God. What more can David say to you for the honor of your servant? For you know your servant. O Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you've done all this, this greatness and making known all these great things. O oh Lord, there's none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself uh, as a people, to make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds, by driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. For you've made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever and do as you have said. I want to take a, a couple of things out of this. You know, David just got told, no. I want to build you a house. And God goes, no, I don't want you to build the house. And again, he says, your son's going to do it. And you, you see a, a heart of David later on in the, in the passages um, that is into preparing for the coming of the temple. But what God says to David is, no, you're not going to build me a house, but I will build you a house. And, you know, there, there are these times, and there are going to be lots of them, where you have an idea, you have a plan, and a lot of times those plans can be something that you think is honoring to God, and that it's a very good thing. And God just goes, no, it's not going to happen. And so that can, that can be in the area of relationships. I've, I've known people over the years that just thought that they were supposed to marry this certain person and that it was all God's plan and, and that, that whole thing was all good stuff that they were praying for. And then it just didn't come to pass and they were bummed about it. Or maybe they were at work and they're looking at the, at the situation at work and, and going, God, if you could just put me in this one place, I, I would just be an influence for you. It would just be a really cool thing. And God just, you know, he, he sets it up where it just doesn't happen. And the answer is no to that. Or sometimes it's in the area of ministry. I want to do something for you, Lord. I want to do this thing for you. 
And God goes, no, I don't want you to do that. What do you do when God tells you no? You, you, you realize that no is just as much an answer from God as yes is, right? Right. And so God can say yes to the things that, that you're praying about. And that's always a good answer. Those are my favorite answers. Yes. And God can say no. And when I was a younger Christian, no was an answer I did not like to hear. I don't want to hear you say no to me, God. I think that everything that I, should, I pray about is things that I should get. I was a brat for Jesus, right? And so I didn't like no until I realized why God was saying no, because he didn't want my life destroyed. Um, there were better things for me. And so now I'm happy with no. If God tells me no about something, I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know? I'm old enough in the Lord to know if God says no, this is, this is a good thing. He's got me going in a, in a different direction. You know, the word, you know, the, the answer that I hate the most is wait. God can do that too. He can say wait to you. But what do you do when God says no? And when God says no, what, what you see David doing, verse 16, it says, then David went in and sat before the Lord. So when God says no, don't stomp out, sit down. And a lot of times people are brats before God. They start getting an attitude. They start, they start getting mad about the fact that God is going against their plans or, or that their plans weren't affirmed or confirmed by God. And when that happens, when God tells them no, they stomp out. What David did was he sat down and he worshiped before God. And he honored the Lord in his worship. And he just said, who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you have brought me this far? God had said to him, I brought you from the sheepfolds to rule over my people, Israel. I've done these things for you. He goes through the whole list of things that he'd done for David, making his name great, all that stuff. And then he goes, and on top of this, I'm going to do these other things for you too, but you're not going to build me a house. The answer to that is no. So the first thing that David did was instead of stomping out, he sat down. And then the second thing that you see David doing is he focuses on the blessings um, that God had promised to him, not on the things that God had banned. You focus on the blessings, not on the banning. And that's where his head's at. This was a small thing in your sight, O oh God. You've also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come and have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree, O oh Lord God. And so David says, who am I? He's got a right attitude towards himself. Um, David is still a shepherd in his own mind. He's still that kid out in the field where all the other brothers are being brought before Samuel and David's just the kid who's left out in the field watching the sheep. Who am I, oh God? And it's a good thing to, to keep in mind. No matter what God does with you, you need to have the attitude of who am I? The second thing, again, is um, you see David... Talking about blessing upon blessing, verses 17 through 22, he talks about the blessings that God pours out on, on David himself, and he talks about the blessing that God, God pours out on Israel, and he focuses on that. And you know, um, when, when God tells you no in an area, the reason that he does it is because he's always got something better for you. It's always that way. And so I'm always good with it. And I don't care if it's things that I want, you know, physical things that I want or situations that I would like to be in or healing or anything. God always has my best in mind. And there, there are times when um, I've asked God to heal me from certain things and he's done it. And then there are other times when I've asked God to heal me and he hasn't done it. I got, you know why I got bad knees? Because I'm willful. Because I, because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I didn't want to ask God about it. My, my first year um, in college when I was playing football, I made a point of not talking to God about it. Because it was just a done deal as far as I was concerned. I'm going to go. I'm going to play football. I don't want to talk to the Lord about it. In fact, my friends asked me about it. Did you talk to the Lord about this? And I just, I, I would just, you know, glow just, just kind of glom over the conversation and move on because I didn't want to talk to him about it. I did not talk to the Lord about, about playing football. And so I go through the season, was, was one of my worst seasons, got hurt all the time, 
And then finally, at the end of the season, I wasn't even playing in a, in a regular football game. I was playing a sandlot game, and a guy came in, and he took out my knee. And as soon as he did it, first thing, I wanted to punch the guy, because we'd, we'd said no, you know, no hitting below the knees, or no hitting below the waist, and he just came and did it, because I was big and he was small, and you know, that's how he was going to do it. I just wanted to punch him so bad, and I didn't, because I was a Christian. And I walked off the field, and as I'm walking off the field, I'm like, this is you, isn't it, Lord? And after, afterwards, um, a couple of years later, I'm praying about my knee, and um, at, at that point, my knee was locked up, and I couldn't straighten it out for about five years. I couldn't straighten my knee out um, because the cartilage had just been all thrashed in there. And so um, during that five years, I was, I was praying uh, for God to heal me and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And actually, there were some other things that took place because of that. I didn't go into the military because of a bad knee. I would have gone in the military. And, um, you know, there were, there were some other things that were happening during that period of time. And this one time I'm, I'm praying about it, and I'm like, Lord, I, you know, will you, will you please heal me? And as I'm praying about it, I'm going through the story of Jacob. Remember what happened with Jacob? Jacob has this whole thing with God where he's wrestling with God all night long. And at the end of the night, the, the Bible says that the Lord's going to leave. It, it's, it talks about an angel in the passage, but in the end you find out it's God. And he says, I'm going to leave. He goes, the sun's coming up. I got to leave. And Jacob um, tells him, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the angel says, I'm going to leave. And he touches him on his thigh and Jacob collapses, and he hangs on to his legs, and he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And it kind of looks when, like when you're reading the story in, in the book of Genesis, it looks like um, what Jacob's doing is he's, you know, it, it, it's like he's got the, the angel in a guillotine or something. He's got him in some wrestling move that he can't get out of and that he's winning or something. You get to the Minor Prophets, you find out that what Jacob is doing is he's holding on to the angel and he's begging and he's weeping while he's holding on to him and saying, I won't let you go unless you bless me. The reason that the angel said, um, the sun's coming up, I gotta leave, is because Jacob had an appointment that day with his brother and 400 guys. And last time he saw his brother, his brother said, I see you again, I'm gonna kill you. And now he's coming with 400 guys. And Jacob, the night before, had taken his family and he took the wife and the children that he loved the least and stuck them out front. And then he had another wife and children that he loved second best and he stuck them behind them. And then he had a wife and a child that he loved the most and he put them in the, you know, on the backside. And then he went across the river um, on his own. And that's where he had the meeting with the angel. So Jacob's in the back of that whole thing with everybody protecting, you know, and that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of guy that Jacob was. And what God does, what, uh, what the Lord did with him was he said, you know, he, he, he's wrestling with Jacob all night long. And finally, um, Jacob goes, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Angel reaches out, touches him on the thigh. His thigh comes out of joint. He collapses. He's hanging on to the angel. And he goes, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And what you have there is a broken man. He's broken. All the, way, all, all the time before that, Jacob was a guy who had his plans and he had his schemes and he did it his way and he, he was sneaky and he was conniving um, with his brother, ripped his brother off. And it was, you know, his brother was stupid, but he ripped his brother off. And then what God did, did was, he, was he sent him to his uncle's house who was a bigger sneak and conniver than he was. And finally, when God's bringing Jacob back, what God wants to do is break the guy and finally get him to the end of himself. And so pulls his thigh out of joint. And um, then he says, okay, what's your name? And Jacob goes, my name's Jacob. Jacob means heel catcher. And by implication, it's the idea of grasping onto somebody else specifically to get what they have. I'm a grasping guy. I'm a thief is what Jacob's name meant. I'm a dirty, rotten thief. And God goes, now your name's going to be Israel, and it means a prince who has power with God. Changes his name. And from that point on, what you see Jacob doing is limping around. From that point on, Jacob always has a staff. 
He's always, he's always seen leaning on his staff. And the, the brokenness that God brought into his life was something that God used for the rest of his life to show him the difference between what he was, the, the sneaky, conniving thief, and what God had made him after he broke him, which was a man of God. And he wasn't perfect from that point on, but he's way different than he was before. And I'm going through that passage when I'm praying about my knee and God goes, I'm never going to heal your knee, Steve. And it's because what he wanted was to break me. He wanted to bring me to the point where it was, it, where it was not my stuff. It was his stuff. It was his work that was being done. And I needed to be okay with it. David in this passage, the third thing that you see him say, saying is, Oh Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning the house, let it be established forever and do as you have said. Um, basically what David's saying there in verse 23 is let it be done. So be it. Amen. And I need, I need to be good with the things that God has promised me. I need to stop looking at the things that God has said no and start looking at the things that God has said yes to. I need to stop, stop pouting about the prohibition and start praying in the promise. And when I do that, my attitude's going to be right and God's going to be in a, in a or I'm going to be in a place where, can, where God can bless me in the, in the way that he wants to. Goes on and says again, verse 25, for you, O my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you've been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. And again, when, when you see what David says about um, what God's done for him, uh, basically in verses 24 and 25, he talks about God being magnified and he talks about the fact that these promises are going to be fulfilled because of God's glory. And then in verse 26 and 27, he talks about the fact that he trusts in God's faithful word. So, who am I? You've given me blessing upon blessing. So be it to what you've, to what you've said to me. I know that you're going to do it for your glory's sake. And I'm going to trust in your faithful word. That's a good place to be, right? We'll end it with that. Let's pray. Thanks uh, again, Jesus, for your love for us. And every single one of us, Lord, have, have things in our life where, where you've done um, specific works in us. And there have been times when, when you've rerouted us and you've said no to things and, and uh, you've brought us into other places um, God, we know that you do those things because you want to bless us and, and that you know us. You know, uh, our, um, you know what's right for us. Um, you, you don't put us in positions that, that, that we aren't ripe for. You don't put us in, in positions that um, are, are going to be something that tear us down and rip us up. You, you're a good father. You see what our talents are. You see, see what our abilities are, you, you have a plan for each one of us and you place us in the position that you have for us because it's good and it's the place that you want to bless us. Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to be um, good with it, that we could say amen and that we could glorify you for it. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the, the blessing of knowing you. Thank you for the, the fact that you want to build us a house uh, thank you for the fact that it's it's what you do for us, what you want to do for us, that you have um, mainly focused in your mind. And uh, Lord, we just want to have the heart of thankfulness and the, and the heart of gratitude uh, that you've called us to. Help us to walk in your strength, walk in your power, and yeah, just ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, bless you guys. <laughs>